first of all, let me warmly congratulate the organizers for this important event happening in difficult times. I would also like to thank them for inviting me to speak about the 70th anniversary of the European Convention on Human Rights. The celebration of this anniversary is important in order to highlight the significance of the Convention as one of the key international and European instruments. This is true for a number of reasons. Firstly, the Convention constitutes one of the greatest peace projects in human history. As stressed in its preamble, human rights and fundamental freedoms are the foundation of justice and peace in the world. Peace is not just the absence of war. As it has been accepted long ago by the United Nations Security Council, gross, massive or systematic violations of human rights constitute a threat to international peace and security. Therefore, by ensuring the observance of human rights by way of a strong mechanism of judicial control is a factor of stability, security and peace. Furthermore, the European Convention on Human Rights reflects the fundamental values of European civilization of the 21st century – democracy, rule of law, liberty and human dignity. As I shall try to demonstrate below, the Convention has greatly contributed to creating a common legal and political culture throughout Europe. Europe's reunification and peaceful coexistence has been based on these values and traditions. At the same time, the Convention is an inspiring instrument not only because it protects a series of rights, but also because it embraces an anthropocentric approach by recognizing the right to individual application. The empowerment of the human being is at the epicenter of the whole system instituted by the Convention. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the Convention has developed an unparalleled dynamic. There are many important human rights instruments at the universal and regional levels. Many of them recognize nowadays the right to an individual petition or communication, but none of them has ever created this extraordinary impetus for an effective protection of human rights. How can this phenomenon be explained? What are the relevant elements in this respect? The answer to this question is much more complex than it may seem at first sight. It has two dimensions, an institutional and a normative one. The right to individual application is undoubtedly the most important institutional element explaining the dynamic development of the European Convention. As amended by Protocol No. 11, Article 34 of the Convention recognizes an unconditional right to lodge an individual application. Its exercise is no longer subject to a declaration confirming that it has been accepted by the state's parties. The unconditional character of this right distinguishes the ECHR, as amended in 1992, from all other universal or regional instruments recognizing individual petitions. Under the European Convention, this is a procedural right in the true sense of the term, which is unique at the international level and available to the 830 million people who fall within the jurisdiction of the contracting parties. The recognition of a right of this kind, combined with a substantial enlargement of the Council of Europe, has led to the exponential growth in the number of individual applications. This evolution rendered the individual a real subject of the system, not a mere user of it. He or she has exactly the same procedural rights as the respondent government. In Mamatkulov and Askarov versus Turkey, the Grand Chamber held that the right of individual application, I quote, is one of the fundamental guarantees of the effectiveness of the Convention system of human rights protection. It is on that basis that the Grand Chamber acknowledged for the first time in this case the binding character of provisional measures. As it is well known, provisional measures became over the years an essential feature of the functioning of the court. The second element explaining the dynamic of the Convention is the permanent character of the Court.
It is well known that the European Court became permanent after the entry into force of the 11th Protocol in 1998. Before that, during the 41st years of its functioning, 59-98, the old court had adopted less than 850 judgments. During the last 20 years, the new permanent court has rendered about 22,000 judgments and has examined more than 850,000 cases, almost a million cases. These figures speak for themselves. It is quite evident that the permanent character of the court creates an esprit de corps. It involves a shift of paradigm. It implies continuous exchange of views among judges, a continuous improvement of working methods, etc. Another important element concerns the execution of the court's judgments. The role of the Committee of Ministers in supervising the execution process is extremely important and unique. The Committee of Ministers is assisted in the performance of its supervisory duties by the Department of the Execution of Judgments of the ECHR, which is part of the Secretariat of the Council of Europe. No other international or regional human rights system has the benefit of an analogous mechanism. The Committee of Ministers is the guarantor of the credibility and the effectiveness of the Convention system. Its supervisory activities have evolved significantly, leading to the adoption of various individual measures in favor of applicants and general measures, whether legislative or other. The Parliamentary Assembly is yet another important actor in the field of execution, especially through its influence on national parliaments. The Commission of the Human Rights of the Council of Europe, as well as other monitoring bodies also contribute to the execution process. At the national level, the execution of judgments of the court may involve not only the executive power, but also the parliament, the judiciary, the office of the government agent, as well as ombudspersons and other independent national human rights institutions. The complexity of the execution process may require, in some cases, a combined action of a number of those national stakeholders. It becomes thus clear that the execution of the ECHR judgments entails a significant mobilization both at the international and national levels, thereby contributing to the dynamics of the whole system. The fourth institutional element I would like to stress is the continuous evolution of working methods. The decade between 2010 and 2020 was the reform decade. This important process was initiated by the Interlaken High Level Conference and was pursued with other analogous events held in Izmir, Brighton, Brussels and Copenhagen. The whole process was completed only months ago. At the same time, the court has invested in continuously improving and refining its working methods. It has thus given full effect to the potential of the 14th Protocol and has undertaken a number of other reforms related to the high-level governmental conferences. The backlog of cases has significantly dropped from around 160,000 pending cases in 2011 to around 60,000 cases today. The committee of three judges have been more and more productive. IT has enormously supported the functioning of the court with significant results, especially during the current sanitary crisis. The directorate of the Juris Consult has greatly contributed to the coherence and consistency of our case law. The non-contentious dedicated phase introduced more than a year ago has begun to produce its effects. The whole system has proven to be very flexible and adaptable to changing and evolving circumstances, including during the first period of confinement due to COVID-19. During this period, that is from the 16th of March up to the 11th of May, the court has been in a position to apply strictly the necessary security measures while at the same time having examined about 5,400 applications and more than 200 requests for provisional measures. The same methodology is being applied now during this second find of uh, uh, lockdown. 
A fifth institutional element explaining the dynamism of the convention system is the will of the court to engage in a dialogue with national authorities and especially with national judicial authorities. Since 2015, the court has created a superior courts network. Nowadays, 92 courts from 40 countries participate in this network, which is the biggest judicial network in the world. The network gives the possibility of exchanges of information, both vertically, that is, between the European Court and National Courts, and horizontally. It promotes easier access to the case law of the Strasbourg Court, including through the so-called knowledge sharing platform. Furthermore, uh, the European Court receives every year a number of delegations from national judiciaries at all levels. I would like to mention, by way of example, the visit of an important delegation from the UK, led by the President of the Supreme Court, Lord Reed, on the 6th of February 2020. It gave the opportunity to affirm the commitment of the British judiciary to the Convention system six days after Brexit. The 16th Protocol to the European Convention of Human Rights is yet another parameter of this dialogue. The first advisory opinion has been adopted in April 2019, further to the request by the French Court of Cassation. A second request has been submitted by the Armenian Constitutional Court. The second advisory opinion has been uh, adopted last May. Another two uh, requests have been uh, submitted very recently. The new advisory opinion procedure presents a great potential and could lead to an important evolution of the role of the Court. Regular dialogue with the Court of Justice of the European Union has promoted the harmonization of the interpretation of human rights provisions by the two European Courts. In the same vein, a series of recent meetings with other uh, Council of Europe monitoring bodies aims at promoting the coherence of the European human rights system. All these forms of dialogue have contributed to the emergence of a distinct European legal identity. This brings me to the second part of my intervention today related to the normative elements which explain the dynamic of the European Convention. My first point in this respect is that the ECHR, as interpreted and applied by the court, permeates most branches of domestic law in the state's parties, private law and civil procedure, criminal law and criminal procedure, penitentiary law, constitutional and administrative law, refugee law, etc. The Convention is perhaps the only international instrument which impacts domestic law to such an extent. The ECHR is a case study from the viewpoint of the relations between international and domestic law. The relationship between the Convention and national law is fusional. Not only is the Convention an integral part of domestic law, but national law may also, in certain cases, become an integral part of the Convention. Take Article 5 on the right to liberty and security, for instance. Any arrest and detention must be in conformity with national law. A violation of the applicable domestic rules amounts ipso facto to a violation of Article 5 of the Convention. The ECHR is 70 years old, but at the same time is incredibly modern. This is due to the so-called evolutive interpretation of the Convention. This method of interpretation was invented in 1978 in the case of Tyler versus the United Kingdom. It means that the Convention should be interpreted taking into account present-day conditions. Quite revolutionary at this time, this method of the interpretation has been endorsed by most international tribunals, including the International Court of Justice. According to the Hague Court, if a treaty is not concluded for a given period of time and contains generic terms, like the Convention, it is the presumed will of the parties that the treaty in question be interpreted in an evolutive manner. Evolutive interpretation has its limits, though. It cannot go against the letter of the Convention. It cannot be contra legem. 
At the same time, it should be in conformity with the object and purpose of the Convention and uh, reflect present day and not future conditions. On the basis of the evolutive interpretation, the Court has dealt with a number of issues concerning, for instance, new technologies, scientific developments or the environment. It has also dealt with vulnerable groups, such as minorities, refugees, unaccompanied minors, or violence against women. Using its interpretative methodology, the Court has strived towards harmonizing human rights standards throughout Europe. Given the diversity of legal systems and traditions in our continent, this is one of the major achievements of the Court. It constitutes, at the same time, a real challenge for individual judges and the Court as a whole. Harmonization does not mean complete uniformity, though. The margin of appreciation doctrine has greatly contributed to striking a balance between harmonization on the one hand and the specificities of different societies and legal system on the other. Depending upon the nature of the rights involved and the relevant context, the margin of appreciation can be wide or narrow. When dealing, for instance, with a major political decision in the context of an economic crisis affecting the right to property, the court recognizes a broad margin. When it comes to a difference of treatment based on sex on se or sexual orientation, the margin of appreciation becomes very narrow. The so-called European Consensus is yet another methodological tool in order to achieve the harmonization of human rights standards. When the Court finds that such a consensus, or at least a clear trend, exists indeed, the margin of appreciation of states usually shrinks. All this brings me to my last point, namely the creation of a distinct European legal and political identity. This seems to be the major achievement of the Court and the Convention system. What emerges after more than 60 years of case law is a common body of rules at the pan-European level based on fundamental values. Genuine democracy constitutes the core of such values. In the words of the Court, and I quote, democracy appears to be the only political model contemplated by the Convention and, accordingly, the only one compatible with it. The Court is the only international body which has defined in such a clear manner the relationship between democracy and human rights. Human rights are not politically neutral. As it resulted from the well-known Greek case more than 50 years ago, the ECHR cannot be correctly applied and effectively respected by a dictatorial or an illiberal regime. Only a genuinely democratic regime is compatible with the philosophy and the spirit of the Convention. Since the beginning of uh, uh, 2018, the Court has applied Article 18 of the Convention concerning abuse of power ten times. In this way, the Court has recently reacted to the democratic deficit that may be observed even today in some European states. The rule of law is another fundamental value which characterizes European legal identity. In a number of cases, the Court has said that the rule of law underpins the whole Convention system. It is inherent in almost all provisions of the Convention. One should bear in mind, however, that the rule of law is not the rule of just any law. Law should reflect the fundamental values and the rights enshrined in the Convention. The right to a fair trial constitutes the quintessence of the rule of law. It reflects the idea of justice and of fair balance which irrigates the Convention. The independence of the judiciary is of paramount importance in this context. The Grand Chamber judgment in Baca versus Hungary is emblematic in this respect. The principles of the Court's case law have been recently recalled by the Court of Justice of the European Union. The Court has communicated relevant cases to a number of states. Judges in those countries are currently facing challenges to their independence. This situation calls for continuous vigilance by the Court and other relevant European institutions. Freedom 
tolerance and broad-mindedness form a triptych which appears as a leitmotif in a long series of judgments relating to freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and freedom of association. This triptych is inherent to any democratic regime and forms part of the distinct European identity. Any form of exclusion, segregation, discrimination, indoctrination and related intolerance has systematically been condemned by the European Court of Human Rights. Furthermore, when examining cases related to terrorism, the Court has always combined freedom and security and try to ensure a balance between those values. The court has shown understanding when faced with the sometimes quite extreme difficulties of the combat against terrorism. At the same time, it has not abandoned the principles of its case law, which have, on the contrary, been restated and strengthened. It has even succeeded in adopting a more in-depth and focused approach through its dynamic interpretation of the Convention. The value of freedom cannot be separated from that of human dignity. Being the linchpin of the international and European conception of human rights, dignity is the prism through which all rights are protected. Human dignity is inherent in all the substantive provisions of the Convention and its protocols. It carries particular weight when it comes to the right to life and the prohibition of the death penalty, the protection of physical and mental integrity, and accordingly the prohibition of torture and inhuman or degrading treatment, together with the prohibition of slavery, servitude, forced labor, and human trafficking. From the quasi-total abolition of the death penalty across the European continent to the extension of the scope of Article 4 of the Convention to encompass trafficking, while not forgetting the volume of case law on ill treatment, the history of the Court's success in preserving human dignity has been outstanding. The Convention, drafted as it was in the aftermath of the atrocities of the Second World War, gives pride of place to peace. Peace is related to the concept of security at national and international levels. Tensions and conflicts between the member states of the Council of Europe, which have given rise to a number of interstate applications, together with the upsurge in terrorism and the flow of migrants and asylum seekers, which is unprecedented in the history of humanity, raise considerable challenges for human rights. The court is often called to deal with them. To conclude, I would say that the parameters which explain the unique character and dynamic of the European Convention are, at the institutional level, the unconditional right of individual application, the permanent character of the court, the unique execution mechanism, the continuous adaptation of the working methods of the court, and the dialogue with national authorities. And at the normative level, the penetration of the Convention into all branches of domestic law, the evolutive interpretation which guarantees the modernity of the text, the harmonization of human rights standards at pan-European level, and the progressive creation of a European legal and political identity. The current circumstances facing Europe and indeed the world are challenging. Many of the fundamental values of the Convention are threatened. I believe, however, that the Court has created the necessary conditions and the framework permitting it to confront those challenges with determination and prudence. Thank you very much for your kind attention.